Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Shrey Madan, country coordinator of India, and myself, Azadin Jamalov, coordinator of Uzbekistan, I am pleased to welcome you to our first UN 75 consultation on youth, peace, and security in the Middle East. As you are aware, there have been mass political upsurges in various regions of the Middle East, leading to state conflicts, both at the internal and external front. The region continues to be at the crossroads inflicted with the conflicts and complex security dynamics that continue fueling them. The effects of these conflicts now stand exasperated as a backdrop of COVID-19 and the rapidly changing world order uh, exposing the deeply troubling fall line in the region's social, cultural, and political dynamics. Amid this backdrop, young men and women stand highly affected by conflicts and its explicit and implicit consequences, making the region one of the most dangerous places in the world for adolescents and youth to live in. This is why at IEPS Asia, we decided to do this UN 75 consultation on youth, peace and security in the Middle East. We know doing it online is not ideal, but on the bright side, it has allowed us great connectivity across borders. This is why we have been also to partner with uh, some amazing organization, including UN 75, UN 2020, SDG Impact Awards, NGO Committee on Sustainable Development and other regional and local organizations across Asia. It is their support that has made today's consultation possible, and I'd like to thank them on behalf of IAPS Asia. The UN75 consultations are meant to engage all of you in open and constructive dialogue and understand how we can ensure a comprehensive involvement of young people in informing the UN what matters to you. Today, we hope to use this platform to amplify your voices. So, please feel free to use the comment section to give us your feedback. Even though we have a segment specifically for the audience at the end, please note that our team will be making notes of your comments, recommendation, queries throughout the consultation, and we'll include all of it in our report to UN75. So I would like to give the floor to Mr. Shrey to introduce our uh, esteemed guest. Mr. Shree? Okay, you're not audible. Ah, Shree is not audible. Okay, I will introduce our panelists and distinguished guests. First up, we have Adam Ben Said, who is a strategist of policy and development with numerous achievements and a wealth of experience under his belt. He is currently working as an investigative journalist and strategist at the TRT World and as a director of strategy of International Islamic Federation of Student Organizations. He is getting his master's in international relations from Bokazishi University, Istanbul. His past experiences include drafting the first uh, organization of Islamic cooperation youth strategy, as well as developing the organization's level tech and startup accelerator. He has served the Malaysian Prime Minister's Office for Youth Capacity Building Management and has participated in the Somalian Medical. Federal Com Government Counterterrorism Campaign and Narrative. Yeah. Yeah. And the next panel is uh, Agatha Lizia Natania, who is a young peace builder from Indonesia, passionate about intercultural and interface program. She is an international relations graduate from Parahayan Catholic University of Indonesia. Currently, she works for the Minister of, for of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia as a staff at the ASEAN Institute for Peace and Reconciliation. She is also head of internal relations at ASEAN Youth Organization. And despite being so young, she spent nearly eight years committing to peace building and youth development for nations across the region. Welcome, Agata. Next uh, panel is uh, Maridul Upathaye is the Asia coordinator of the United Network of Young Peace Builders with coordinating with and networking for 13 organizations from eight countries of the region. In 2015, he co-founded Youth for Peace International, a UNO member organization in India. He's a development professional who is passionate about transformational youth leadership and peaceful social development. 
Thus, he has been working at the community, national, regional, and international levels through ground projects, networking activism, trainings, and policy advocacy for the last 10 years. Maridul has been a youth consultant to UN Security Council's Resolution 202050 Progress Study and Youth Peace and Security Consultation, and contributing author to UNESCO Youth Lead Guide and Prevention of Violent Extremism Through Education. Maridul was chosen as a Commonwealth Young Achiever, is currently also a United States Institute of Peace Generation Change Fellow. Next uh, panel is a Jan Helch Kalvik is an advisor and senior strategic affairs fellow. Jan is an editor in chef and founder of the international magazine <laughs> Defense <laughs> and Intelligence Norway. He is also the public relations expert at Public Relations Norway AS. As an objective, old school journalist and truth hunting editor through the last 30 plus years. Kalvik has made himself known for publishing solid fact-checked material on important international challenges like security, anti-terror, peace processes, and military missions. He has served as an editor of social media as the Maltese Knights of Norway, Commander Set Suniba. And uh, honorable, we have Arne Gerd Helversen, is a former member of United Nations War Crime Investigation Group in a former Yugoslavia. He has been responsible for the United Nations and NATO Military Police Special Investigation Group in seven missions for seven years. He has been an instructor at the United Nations and NATO Military Police courses. He has been involved in several peacekeeping efforts in wars and internal, uh, internal conflicts. He was an international observer in the city of Hebron, managing the Israel-Palestine conflict, and also served in the UN military uh, police in Lebanon, Camp Rafah in Egypt, and many other places. He, he has also served in the Norwegian Air Force and held the mark of a captain and pilot, and now the title of veteran given by the Royal Norwegian Air Force. So we are beyond honored to host Arne, Adam, Jan, Agatha, Mridul, and learn from their extensive experiences at our first UN 75 consultation on youth, peace, and security. So I would like to give the floor to uh, uh, Mr. Arne Gerrit Helversen uh, to introduction remarks. So Mr. Arne, could you please yes. give us introduction I'm remarks? Can I am with you. I uh, to introduce a little bit about myself. I'm a educated police officer in Norway and also a educated military police officer. And uh, I joined the UN in 1966, uh, cost to the Suez War, and uh, I came into UNF one in uh, Gaza and uh, the area around. And uh, since then, I have done my diaries whilst on duty, and I have been reading a lot about the Middle East. And uh, I have also had the position of a special investigator for United Nations. And uh, later, I became a commander for uh, these groups. And um, about the Middle East, it's uh, complex and a great case, and uh, it is uh, very important to know when you go on a mission to read the history of the area. You have to read about the religions, a lot about knowing what uh, group of uh, people living there. So uh, the Middle East is full of stories, but I, can, uh, I will show you a book which I will recommend. It's the name of uh, the biography of Jerusalem. And uh, the book is here. It's uh, made, I can read the... Uh, the yeah, yeah, the biography of Jerusalem. Yeah, yeah. and uh, if you, this book goes back uh, about 2000 years before Christ. And it's a, uh, it's a, uh, about 600 pages to read in English, and it's uh, written by Simon Sebag Montefiore. And I have read the book, and it's very interesting, and it gives you a perfect view of what has taken place 
of today. And um, prior to United Nations, it is also important to, to know this one, the chapter of the United Nations, to read this and see what you are after. And um, uh, when it's important to start with the history, because uh, there has many things taken place in the Middle East, like uh, we can talk about this uh, building of the Suez can Channel. We have the, the First World War, the Ottoman Empire. We have the uh, Great Power, and also uh, the Second World War, and also the establishing of Israel as a state, and also Jordan. Jordan was in the beginning a part of uh, Saudi Arabia. And um, then uh, later, all the people involved. So, uh, so yeah, I'm, hello. Yeah. Hello, yeah. You can consider Mr. Arnie. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there are so much to, to, to take part in and to read. We have also the the um, the uh, uh, Balfour Declaration. We have uh, uh, the what did we say the the British Empire, the fall of the British Empire, and what uh, caused that. We had uh, officers uh, from uh, this period joining, uh, for example, in uh, in the Jordan where they uh, arranged or organized the, the uh, Arab Legion. Legion. It is, um, it, I can continue with the books. First. Okay. And, yeah, the, this book is very important, A Peace to End All Peace. And? This is yes. very interesting. And the, the next one is uh, this one. This is more, it's made in Israel, so it's a little bit, uh, not objective, all of it. And uh, the next is that there was an officer in uh, in uh, Jordan by the Jordan League. His name was John Baggett Glove. He was a British general who took part and uh, organized the the army in Jordan in uh, mm. the thirties and the fifties. He was mm. later. Uh, he was later uh, uh, removed by King Jordan, by uh, King Hussein in Jordan, and uh, they um, gave the fault of this case to Nasser at the time when he was in power, because mm. Nasser wanted to be the what shall I say, the great ruler of the Middle East, and mm -hmm. with with uh, Anthony Eden, he. Uh, Foreign Minister of Anthony Eden's uh, government was named by Anthony Nutting. He wrote the book No End of no Lessons. End. Yeah, and uh, this book tells you how the '56 war took place. Oh, great! Yeah, and also uh, there are there are so much to read and to get hold of, but. In, we can also say that in 48, when Israel as a state was established, 15 of May, I mean, 1948, he, uh, the British uh, officer was commanding the Arab League, and there was an Arab League that uh, fought against Israel. It was not the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but you might still put, give me some questions as well during the way. So okay, uh, I think you will continue sharing your experience during our consultation, and I think that your recommendations with books will be useful for everyone who are interested in the Middle East and in the Arab-Israel conflict. So thank you yeah. very much, Arnie. And uh, we are opening our consultation with a segment one, which is uh, what has the UN those done so far? So I would like to give the floor to Mr. Mridul with his presentation in what has the UN's progress been so far with respect to use peace and security? Mr. Mridul. Thank you very much. Um, I would just quickly go into the presentation itself so that we save some time. 
there is a lot of uh, discussion that need to happen based on what I'll be sharing. If you can give me a screen sharing option. Uh, of a technical officers, the root authority will give you. So I made you co-host. That should allow you yeah. to share your screen. Great. It's working. Thank you very much. So are you able to see my screen? Yes, yes. Perfect. You can continue. So uh, just to give you this perspective, like what I'm sharing, I'm sharing all of it uh, from the work that I'm doing. Uh, this the organization, United Network of Young Peace Builders. It's a global network of youth-led peace building organizations. And we have 110 members all over the world from 58 countries. Um, so now I take you back uh, to some of the things that happened, let's say, in 2001, 2002, 2003. Uh, actually, the major narrative that you see for young people, uh, you will find that there are two kinds of major narrative that we have. Number one is narrative of victim. Young people are victim, so they need to be supported. Okay, somehow like, okay, you, you need to do something for them. And some, uh, the other narrative is young people are the perpetrator. So you need to stop them. This is the major narrative. And that is also very much gender segregated. So young female are the victim of violence and young male are the perpetrator of the violence. So you need to support young female somehow and you need to stop uh, the young male uh, doing all the, uh, all the chaos uh, they are making in the world. This is the major narrative that we have. But the issue is that nobody is thinking from the lens of the young people who are actually doing amazing work like your role or IAPPS, the kind of communication you are having, your idea is not to support either some kind of victimization or either some kind of uh, perpetration. Uh, you are trying to do, a, like you are trying to contribute a meaningful, engaging way uh, so that young people can contribute more in their community, right? That's the idea. But when we think from this victim and perpetrator lens, nobody is talking about you. They are just talking about someone else and that is actually a minority. That's a huge issue. Uh, there are many facts which you can, which I can give you, where uh, you will see like what are the actual numbers uh, which are actually affected or which are actually doing uh, or falling into violence. Majority of young people are not falling into the violence or are not getting affected of it also. Um, so the thing is, when you are not seeing young people as a peace builder, you are not including them in the decision making. And when you do not in, uh, include them, that is a problematic thing because you will not promote uh, their role as the peace builder and you will not create any structures, any institutions, any policies to support them. So that is where the issue arises. Everything starts from the narrative, how everyone else sees everyone else. Uh, so yeah, there was this um, global uh, like idea that, okay, this this whole idea started when the conversation around counter violent extremism or preventing violent extremism started uh, and that was also driven a lot by uh, let's say the fear the trust deficit that we have uh, for the young people specifically coming from a specific religious background uh, whole idea started in early 2000 uh, so a lot of young people started feeling okay we do not believe in this i think we are we are not lying into this dichotomic point of view that we have uh, so over one uh, 11,000 young uh, people from 110 countries, um, they they came together. They were having discussions over a period of eight years. There were a lot of advocacy happened, and uh, these advocacy were led by this organization UNOI, which I'm a part of, Search for Common Ground, and Government of Jordan. And the idea was we want to bring all of these stakeholders together for some kind of global consensus, uh, so that uh, people's uh, positive contribution uh, to peace building in their communities can be also appreciated and can be uh, supported. Uh, now, when this happened, uh, we got this resolution, uh, United Nations Security Council Resolution 2250. 2250 is just a number, by the way, sequence number. Uh, this is the first ever resolution. We got this resolution on 9th December 2015. And this is the first time when the, the role of young people actually got formalized first time like it was accepted that yes young people play a relevant political uh, field in terms of peace and security uh, now the second key important is that it defined also young people as 18 to 29 years old 
uh, then uh, because young people were already doing a lot of movement, so it just built upon that. So we also need to think from a lens that it is not something which UN created or UN give it to us. Uh, there was also these consultations happening in Jordan itself. 400 people came in August 2015, and then the recommendation came out of that forum. And that forum, this is called Amman Declaration, and Amman Declaration went to United Nations Security Council. It was presented because Jordan <clears> at that <throat> point of time was uh, one of the uh, Security Council member. So they presented it and it got accepted. So it came from young people. This was the first time when a security council uh, like came up of any resolution when young people are directly contributing to it. And very key important part is the charter which Mr. Arni was sharing. We need to understand that this title of resolution 2250 is under maintenance of international peace and security, which is referred to the charter seven and article 39 of UN charter, the chapter seven of uh, the charter. And everything which comes under chapter seven is legally binding. So it is not that once you have this resolution, you need to have any consultation with the uh, countries and then there is some treaty which need to be ratified. It is already legally binding. So every country who is a UN uh, member you can ask them, okay, what has been the progress in the last five years? Now, uh, this resolution talks about five specific things, participation, protection, prevention, partnerships, and disengagement and reintegration. You can read more about it. It's a longer part. So like how young people can participate more in the decision making, how every civilian and specifically the young people need to be protected from any kind of violence, how prevention uh, steps need to be prioritized more instead of countering me uh, mechanisms, then how a young people's agency is so that you need to partner with young people and you need to partner with other stakeholder also. These were the guidelines. And then some people who are already engaged in this, how you can disengage and how you can reintegrate them. Now, what happened, uh, the idea was that, okay, we have some, some understanding, but we do not have any specific reliable data. So we need to carry out a progress study. Um, and then we need to give some recommendation also. And then at the same time, we also need to develop something. Okay, we got this resolution, how it can be put into practice. Uh, so this progress study came and this progress study is called Missing Peace Report, uh, which is an independent progress study on youth peace and security. How it came into picture. So over the period of two years, uh, there were several uh, focus group discussions, regional discussions, uh, national level discussions, online, in-person, country level, and over uh, 4,230 young people were consulted in this process. And then we got this really amazing uh, like uh, a progress study of what people are doing, what are their motivators, what are their challenges, how we can support them more, how country can do more uh, around it. I'm specifically now talking about these key finding which are coming about uh, coming for youth peace building organizations so not individuals specifically organizations so in this progress study 399 youth led peace building organizations um, were uh, consulted and we got that 97% uh, of their staff is unpaid they are doing it voluntarily right so having that expectation that like they will be do able to do amazing work it's so unfair the second point is that they are already gender balanced. They are somehow having like mixed leadership of 50 to 45% uh, kind of thing. And the third part is the funding is a huge challenge because 49% of them are operating with under 5,000 per annum. If you know about your own countries, I think 5,000 yearly is not even a salary of a beginner level lawyer or any kind of social development uh, official. So if this is the number, how these people will be able to do amazing work, right? That's an unfair expectation. So uh, again, the second part is that it debunked some of the myth. Usually what happens, there is this idea that, okay, uh, youth population is increasing, then it will be creating more violence. But actually there is no correlation as such. Youth bulge doesn't mean that there will be more violence. Second is the idea of that, uh, young migrant, refugees, and IDPs, internally displaced people, are a threat. I think this is also uh, something, a myth, which was debunked in this uh, study. Then also that young people are not drawn to violence just because they are not having employment and education. This is also unfair, uh, let's say, 
myth uh, for young people there is no correlation between education and employment and people falling into violent extremism or violence um, and then uh, key one is that hard fisted law enforcement and security approaches that we have those are counterproductive so you need to work with community you need to work with young people uh, so these were a few things and the key specific things that uh, recommendation was given those were you need to include young people you need to invest in their agency and their leadership and you need to partner with young people i think these were the very key specific one and it's a long report so you can definitely read more about it some more things happened uh, in so the first resolution we got in december 2015 the second resolution we got in april 2018 and this resolution was specifically talking about how young people can engage more in formal peace processes so peace processes are different than peace building processes peace processes are something let's say what is happening uh, in afghanistan or philippines uh, or colombia so some of the countries are going through those formal peace agreement and negotiations so how young people can engage more so this resolution came from that lens and then another resolution came actually in july itself 14 july 2020 and this resolution talks it's a very amazing resolution the current one because it is very action oriented it talks about protecting civic and po uh, political spaces for young people how uh, different kind of youth uh, like diversity of youth can be engaged um how they can be engaged more through national action plans and how more resources can be created and then uh, there has also been a global coalition on youth peace and security so different un agencies uh, civil society organizations young people youth led organizations uh, there is a global coalition kind of a network like you have and that network has 70 Uh, uh, 70 different organizations and institutions, and it is led by UNOI Search for Common Ground and UN uh, PBSO or UN FPA. Uh, so that that is also doing a lot of work, like how together we can go ahead. So these are the uh, few things that has been in the progress. I think this is my last slide, and uh, one key important thing for young people is that though it like whatever UN creates, it is towards member state more. so it is member states responsibility to implement this resolution at the national level but this is our agenda this is our resolution young people's resolution so we we need to be like playing a key integral role in terms of advocating for its implementation and advocating for its monitoring or monitoring of implementation and the second part is that we at our end also need to try to lead some of these conversation by creating national uh, national coalitions regional coalitions and uh, like uh, try to do more of implementation at our end so your initiative is also one part of that i'm sorry for like going 3 minutes more than the time i think there was just a lot thank you very much thank you very much for sharing your experience uh, for this uh, wonderful presentation uh, i would like to give uh, the floor to uh, to second moderator mr shrey uh thank you so much uh, fasilin for the floor and thank you so much middle sir for this wonderful analysis now with that uh, coming to the segment 2 with this uh, which is the critical evaluation of the work has been done by the U uh, un so far uh, i would like to ask adam sir that uh, since you have a expertise in the field of policy development and the strategy so uh, what i would like to ask is the united nations security council resolution or the youth peace and security are they enough or do you think is there any scope of improvement on that thank you so much sir thank you very much um my thanks to the previous speaker for his excellent presentation he definitely highlighted a lot and i'm happy he emphasized that uh it's not a dichotomy of uh youth being protected versus youth being uh feared essentially as instigators of violence and radicalism That said, I, I don't think it's my place to comment on whether the uh, UN Security Council resolution is effective at doing what it is. The uh, UNSG receives regular reports, and there's a whole mechanism for tracking its progress. I can comment, however, as somebody who has worked in the spaces between intergovernmental agencies, civil society organizations, and nations, that um, often, as youth and as policymakers, we uh, forget the structure of change in our societies. um in the ecosystem of the world as it was um these un security council resolutions the resolutions and and decisions adopted by major igos such as the organization of islamic cooperation the eu and the un are simply frameworks for action and ultimately whether it is binding or not binding a lot of this falls on the nation states to actually implement 
or at the very least to allow. Um, I won't shy away from saying this, but um, there are a lot of countries that are pretty much not youth friendly, not pro youth, and they see youth as a security risk, essentially, that can be radicalized. Um, they subscribe and ratify to uh, amazing resolutions and action plans adopted on the floor of the UNGA or the UN Security Council. But in reality, as our previous speaker mentioned, in civil society, you have organizations that are doing essential work for you at $5,000 a year. So uh, ultimately, what comes down to, it comes down to, it boils down to essentially a major gap in uh, civic society between um, governments and civil society and between civil society and the international or regional scene. And uh, fundamentally, what this means is that a lot of our youth um, are often waiting for change to come from the highest levels, whether from their own governments or from major organizations such as the UN or the EU or whatnot. And um, over the years, I've come to the realization that um, there is something missing and primarily uh, civil society has not been allowed to develop and to mature in a lot of our countries. And what I mean by that is that a healthy functioning civil society may pose a risk or a threat, a security risk in and of itself to certain governments um, throughout the region. And more fundamentally, I feel like a lot of our youth have learned a specific brand of activism and uh, social work or youth work that functions in democratic environments, let's say, where there is um, freedom of speech and participation and where your vote and, and, and your, your numbers count. But um, in our specific regions, we've never really learned social organization. We've never really studied uh, what it takes to make a social impact. And in this, I advise our youth to go back to the civil societies of the 70s and the 80s even, and to look at how they accomplished specific achievements. It wasn't through uh, resolutions per se, but it was through mass grassroots action, civic organization, an effective coordination between civil society um, as a whole in any specific country. So uh, yes, well, I think the UNSC resolution is essential and it's a beginning. Uh, ultimately, we do have to look at the role of civil society and whether it's functioning effectively or not. Um, that's my take on it. Thank you, Thank you for your... Thanks. So uh, in the Middle East, uh, where almost 30% of the population is between 15 and 29, it's about 100 million young people, long-term prosperity and stability hinge on the opportunities afforded to this generation. So my question to Arnie on what has been done to ensure maximum inclusion of local voices and dynamics in the peace building processes in the Middle East? What hindrances have been faced in the making the process inclusive? What can be done to overcome these hindrances? The, um, the, the first United Nations mission in the Middle East was a successful mission uh, prior to what uh, the feedback has been. And, uh, but uh, the end of it, it in 67, it was a failure done by the United Nations Security. Uh, no, the, the Secretary General, because he did not uh, bring the case forward to United Nations uh, Security Council. So it was in um, the mission was ended by a failure because they were told by Nasser to remove or maybe to the other side of Israel, but Israel did not accept it. And I think that the end of this mission was done by a failure from United Nations. But um, there has uh, the, in the, the, I'm also thinking about, you're talking about Security uh, Council and uh, the resolutions. We have also, I have been also taking part in the, this is a peace mission, peace creating mission, but we have also peace forcing mission. And uh, I was with this in uh, former Yugoslavia, where we invaded the whole country. And this was quite a different case. So, uh, but maybe you can address me some, uh, repeat the question so I can give you the correct answer. Okay. Uh, what has been done to ensure maximum uh, inclusion of local voices and dynamics in the peace-building processes in the Middle East? 
<laughs> yeah, it's um, uh, I I didn't follow you exactly, but uh, the um, the Middle East, United Nations has been in the Middle East for a long time, since uh, first time in 1958 in Lebanon, and also okay. to to the other areas. And uh, they have several missions, and they have uh, had a very good impact on the local society. And uh, this, the, because the, the population receive a lot of support from the different nations or the different missions for free. And uh, I think that these uh, United Nations missions in the Middle East have had a very positive purpose. Mm. But... Uh, the problem is that they have been too long. You can see Unifil now. They have been there since 1978. And uh, also in uh, in up in Golan, they have been there since 73. The only mission from 73 was, uh, was uh, ended in uh, UNF2 down with in Egypt. So, uh, but I think that in general, the UN missions have a purpose in the area. They, they bring forward things to people so they can have a better life. Mm -hmm. Did you thanks get an for, answer? Yes, I get it. Uh, so uh, thanks for, your, uh, for sharing with uh, your experience. And uh, right now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Frey to continue our uh, segment. So thank you, Fesslin, for the floor, and thank you, Mr. Arni, for this wonderful analysis, uh, insightful uh, analysis of your report. And now, um, since uh, we are pro we are uh, we are running a little bit uh, short on time due to the time constraints, uh, I would like to invite comments from our distinguished uh, panelists on how are we uh, measuring the success and the success and the impact of youth learning intervention. And do we have enough data to inform our policies, its shortcoming and potential success? Uh, I would like to ask our panel panelists to get a few comments on upon that. Thank you so much. Who would you want to answer, Shre? Uh, Ma'am, it's an open question. Anyone can ask me, uh, answer that in like a sentence or so, in 10 or so. Okay, well, does anybody want to take the lead on that? I believe I can answer this. I worked sure. for the uh, Statistical Economic Research Organization of the OIC for a time. And um, as you said, one of, the, one of the major issues we came into actually was the lack of available data to guide public policy. So at least 40% of our efforts went towards building statistical capacity in our member countries. And uh, the unfortunate thing is that as and we had ongoing campaigns to end poverty, to reduce violence and so on and so forth. But because of the lack of data, more often than not, it was um, guided by intuition and experience rather than actual hard data. And these capacities take a significant amount of time to develop. And on the ground, there were very few partners that you were able to work with um, that collected these sorts of data. There weren't think tanks in our civil societies. Um, of the caliber that actually kept population level data and governments and ministries were not very incentivized to conduct this sort of data collection capacity because it exposed uh, perhaps unhealthy practices on their parts. Thank you. But I, would, I would like to add, however, though, that um, fortunately there was a significant wealth of UN data, general indicators that still allowed us to develop good policy. Um, again, though, the issue is always in implementation and um, strategies can be the most intricate, beautiful things ever designed and uh, down to the national roadmaps and action plans. You can have matrices for cooperation with specific organizations, but if the toolkits are not available to these uh, civil society organizations to, if your stakeholders and governments are not actually willing to make a change, then nothing will happen. And that is why the biggest question of all is how do you actually engage your stakeholders in meaningful change? Thank you so much, sir. And now I would like to give the floor to Fesla Din. So thank you very much, uh, Shri. So we move to the segment three, the road forward. Uh, 
uh, we have uh, so many trends. And in recent years, there have been significant changes in the content and priority of security processes in the region. It has become the epicenter of transitional terrorism. The implementation of Iran's nuclear program has become one of the uh, most pressing global problem in the field of nuclear non-proliferation. Today, a complex of contradiction between Iran and the majority of Arab countries on the one hand and between Iran and Israel and on the other hand has come to the fore. So uh, my question is to Mr. Yan, uh, what major trends should, be, should we be looking out for that will greatly change the security dynamic of the region and ultimately impact the quality of life for young people in the region? That was a, that was a big, uh, big question for an um, editor of a small magazine, but I will, uh, I will try to, uh, to give my, uh, my view of that. Uh, uh, first of all, I don't think the Middle East, we will not see the Middle East as an epicenter for peace in the future. Not, not uh, for the first 20 or 25 years, but things are changing rapidly. Uh, and when it comes to statistics and, uh, and uh, collecting of, of facts, like, like we were talking about, like, uh, like Adam so nicely put it, yes, it is easier to get the facts and to get the statistics. Uh, and because of the development of social media, I think it, is, it will, or it is already more easy to put pressure on governments on an international basis. And if these movements, organized or not, if these movements are backed by international institutions like the United Nations, I can see a brighter future than the past have been dark. So yes, it, I can see many positive things that might happen, but it will take some time. Mm -hmm. Thank for your expertise. Uh, Mr. Shri, uh, will we continue? Uh, sure, first let me stop. So um, as, you're, as we are all aware that Middle East has a troubling interstate relationship. So uh, Ernie, sir, I have this question for you. Uh, how vital do you think is the regional stability in the context of security here? And do you think of what role UN can play uh, in the regional stability of the Middle East? Uh, I have a saying, uh, very naive, but we people, when we came home, they asked us, does it help what you do? And I said, yes, it does. Even if, if you were not there, it wouldn't help. So it's important for you and to be present in the area. And I can see from my experience from 1966 and following developing in the Middle East since then, there are many things in a positive manner that has taken place, like peace uh, deal between Egypt and Israel, Jordan and Israel, and uh, the uh, the, uh, now they are taking place with the United Arab Emirates and Israel, and uh, there are many positive things taking place. So I, and I also experienced when I was there that many of the young people, the youth, they are coming with a change in, in the atmosphere because they want more or less to have mostly peace with their neighbors, because they were uh, they were envying us in Norway that we have the good peace with our neighbors, and they would like to have the same, no matter if it's uh, in Jordan or Israel or Egypt, they are coming closer. But uh, I think that another thing is that, uh, from my experience, is that what the Western world do or have done is that they. They believe they, that the people in the Middle East, they do think the same, have the same thoughts as they have. But uh, we should be aware that people in the Middle East 
have other things on their minds as well. And that's why we are failing. We can see with the, go back to the, the Iraqi wars, two wars, we can go to Libya, for example, and uh, uh, I think that most, much of what has been caused or damaged in the Middle East is also done by the Western world so far. There are much to talk about there, but uh, I, can, uh, I get news every day. I read news uh, from three, four different sources, and I, I mean I have a good picture of it. But uh, there are things in progress, that's for sure. So, uh, but um, I think that the, the, not the headache, but the, the, the greatest effort now is to the case with Iran and the nuclear deal. So um, that so far was it, uh, did I answer your question? Exactly, sir. Thank you so much for this and a wonderful analysis and your insights on this subject. As we are all aware that uh, we have been seeing this trend that uh, today's youth and especially today's youth has been really proactive in the international affairs and they're trying striving so hard to achieve our one common goal that is to ensure the peace and stability in basically in the entire uh, in the entire world. So ma'am Agatha ma'am we have a question for you. So what do you, how can a young woman, a man and woman uh, can facilitate to this process? And do you think that uh, the interest rate issues that are important to the address and ensure the stability in the peace or uh, peace in the region? Uh, and can you see, uh, so these are, the, uh, these are the two questions that I would like to ask you, Agatha. Uh, Ma'am, could you please answer that? Thank you. Okay. Uh, first of all, a very good morning, good afternoon, or a good evening to you all. Um, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm so honored to be here. And um, I would like to extend my warm welcome to all panelists. Uh, my name is Agatha. Um, I'm not an expert on Middle East. However, I have quite extensive um, experiences in the peace building in the Southeast Asia region. Um, and also in the past years, I have been active in the peace and security for the young people and also for the women. So thank you so much, moderator, for the question. I think it suits me um, for, uh, of my experiences. So when we talk about peace building in the region, especially about young people, we need to take into account um, like Mr. Arnik said earlier about the context and the history in the region. Uh, we cannot just uh, take the lesson learned from one region and, and directly apply it to the other region because of the regional context and the history they have like different um, change and different um, conditions. However, um, if we want to take a look in the peace building processes, first, I think uh, Mr. Marido already co um, conveyed the five points of the Youth Peace and Security uh, Resolution. Um, and I want to point out that the point of protection is indeed very important. So we, when we talk about men and women in the peace our negotiation tables, uh, women are still seen as a victim. Therefore, they are not included in the negotiation table, but they are being discussed. So I think this is one of the critical points that uh, more women need to be included in the negotiation table, not only as a subject to be talked about. Um, and I think uh, with the era of technology, a lot of young women are aware of this issue. And then we have seen a lot of women peace builders, not only in the region, but in, in a lot of places in the world. I think this is uh, one of a good um, starting point on how we can have these women peace builders as the examples on how uh, men and women even though they are still young or they already have experience before, but they need to be uh, included also in the, in the peace processes, particularly in the decision-making. Um, I know that this is not an easy process. This is not as easy as we talk about it, but, um, uh, but this point is very important uh, in the peace processes and also in the context of 
building culture of peace. Um, I hope I will have another chance to talk about culture of peace, but uh, but for this point, I give back to the moderator first. Thank you very much, Agatha. Thank you, so much. Thank you so much. So now uh, we, uh, we, we are continuing our segment three as a road forward. Uh, I have a question to Mr. Adam. Uh, what can be the other alternatives or policies that uh, the stakeholders think will bring in the change in the mindset which supports extremism? And uh, can cultural change be helpful in broadening the perspective of the use of the affected region? Okay. Um, first of all, this is a this is a personal opinion, but um, I genuinely think that sometimes the actions of stakeholders are what contribute towards uh, sympathy towards extremism. It's not that um, we're all well, the majority of us are youth here, and and I think we can resonate with this. Nobody wakes up in the morning and decides I'm going to be an extremist or a terrorist. There is a, a radicalization process, a staircase, if you will, that's very well documented. I'm happy that um, somebody mentioned earlier that it's not people don't become terrorists for economic reasons. Um, and then again, religion is really not to blame as well. When we look at extremism, a lot of it uh, distorts faith and religion and ideology to the extent that uh, you really can't hold the original faith accountable. It's a perversion of logic. It's a perversion of ideology and psychology. Um, in our findings, and I'll address the specific point you raised in a moment, in our findings, the issue comes down to narrative. And often the narrative of youth as victims uh, contributed very much so to disenfranchisement, isolation, and uh, anti-stakeholder sentiment, honestly, exclusion. If you feel like your government is not giving you a voice, if you feel like the pathways towards self-actualization are not available to you, there's a high chance you will be radicalized. Um, so it's very easy for a government to go to uh, an IGO, um, ratify a larger strategy, come home, declare it on national television. Let's be conscious of the pathway of change here, right? And to the person that's um, observing these changes and developments and policies being implemented, does it actually have an impact on his or her life? That's the thing. So a lot of this falls in the hands of the stakeholder themselves. Now, you asked what can the stakeholder do to uh, reduce these sympathies, to um, eliminate them? It's to provide a counter narrative, essentially, or a narrative that is more powerful than the ones that are being uh, uh, propagated by extremist and radical groups. So if you go back to the base motivation, every young person is um, essentially wants to live a good life, wants to be financially secure, wants to be healthy, wants to have uh, the means to self-expression and, and to do to follow his or her passions, essentially. But um, why is it that it bothers them so much to the point that they'll pick up arms? It's that they look back on different narratives that promise them a golden age of the past, promises them uh, more meaning, promises them an, a, a part in change itself. Uh, here's the uh, change that we want. Pick up arms to make it happen. But I'm telling you that in every situation where youth have a medium of affecting change and implementing change, whether through youth parliaments, whether through consultation groups, whether through... Uh, intrinsic satisfaction of seeing the policies they're lobbying for on a civil society level happen, you won't get radicalism in these societies. Uh, that's, that's my take on it. And um, in terms of specifics, things that we've actually worked on that made a difference, setting up adjunct youth parliaments and youth groups adjacent to government's policymaking made a big deal, especially when it was fairly representative of youth and society. This is something I just mentioned in the comments. When we talk about um, youth as a whole, you have to realize that the niche circles of uh, model, model UN and model OIC, as excellent as they are, these activist woke youth that work in civil societies and are passionate about making the world a better place, this only constitutes a minority of youth. And in our policy making, we need to be more inclusive of this. We need to be conscious that the majority of youth, unfortunately, are living very difficult lives in terms of uh, access to the basic uh, human rights that we take for granted. So um, our policies need to be inclusive of this and our policies need to be representative of this. And one, mention, one thing I mentioned was the youth parliaments, youth groups that actually have a say in legislation. That's a huge thing to achieve in any given country. And the other is organization of civil society. And one thing that uh, NGOs can subscribe to, one thing that IGOs can help civil society in any country do 
is hold co excellent consultations like this, but with in every separate country, this is something we did in the OIC, we would have regional consultations or national consultations with permission from the host country and bring together all the major um, NGOs or civil society groups in one sector. So women's rights, youth, whatnot. And you would sit with them and help them plan. Because as I said, uh, we've never really learned to strategize or execute policies or change on a meaningful level. So we would coach them on how do you actually achieve these tangible results? How do you lobby governments? How do you design resolutions? How do you design follow-up and implementation for these things? And then you would let them sit with each other without influencing um, their policies because this is a reflection, organic reflection of the policies of that country and let them decide on how to coordinate for the next year. And over time, we would bring different sectors together and allow them to coordinate. Essentially, when you have a civil society that is organized and coordinated and able to focus on one or two or three major items, it is very difficult for governments, especially in this day and age, post-Arab Spring and in the age of social media, to deny them. Um, so essentially, together, we can make a difference. And um, when we are fragmented, unfortunately, we cannot. That's my take on it. Thank you very much, Mr. Arden, for this wonderful answer. So, Mr. Shrey, I will give the floor to you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Fesladin. And thank you, Adam, sir. It was a wonderful can answer. I, can you, guys, can I jump in really quickly? Because I have sure. a point that I really, really would want to ask the panel over here. Because for the so far, the conversation has been about changing the narrative, changing the mindset, right? And I cannot help but think that there is a leadership deficit, right? Um, the kind of quality of leadership that we do see is not really conducive. We, we don't really have good models when we talk about Middle East or even our countries, right? Do you think that that definitely has a role to play um, in, in, in resisting the change you want to see these young people bring? Is there a role this lack of leadership is playing in all of this? I can answer this. Um, well, can, and then Adam, and can you, can, Gaza, can you follow up Adam after that? Because I really want to hear from you. Yeah, okay, Adam, go ahead. I have a few words to say. Yeah, me too. Okay, so Adam, Agatha, Ernie, and Jan, all right? Yes. Adam, go ahead. Okay, briefly, I think that uh, it's not so much, it's not so much the leaders um, as the lack of systems, the lack of public policy decision-making systems. We don't, our, our, the decisions made by our leaders are very much um, affected by which side of the bed they wake up on. And um, I say this with all respect, it's, it's the truth. And um, frankly, reactionism to regional uh, actions to, like governments won't take actions on economic, pol uh, economic issues until they see that the people are very angry, for instance. So there's a fundamental lack of strategic culture and strategic capacity building. There's a near relative absence of data-driven uh, public policy. And these are things that will not be implemented uh, by the status quo governments. This has to be introduced by youth who are literate in these areas and who make recommendations and lobby based on this sort of thing. So the lack of leadership, obviously, yes, uh, but bad leadership is an issue of the world over. The idea um, with proper democratization is that you have governments that are able to make good decisions regardless of who is elected because of proper state functions that are data driven, informed, engaged and connected. Thank you so much, Adam, for bringing that up. I just want to add some points. Um, I think it's true that um, as, uh, as a youth, we need somebody as our role model. And in this case, and when we talk about peace building, it has to be somebody that has this kind of energy that that become uh, that gives us this the spirit um, to to follow what they do in in promoting peace. So what what my point is that I I really think that the term peace builder is not just limited to certain people. We are all peace builders. So I think to make this term common um, to 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 make our self belief that we are a peace builder that we need we have this shared our common responsibility to to maintain the peace only this is the is where we can together as young people we can bring the change uh and we we should we certainly do not have to wait for for the change or or the initiatives from 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 the government or from different large organizations so um I'd like to point out that in grassroots communities, um, young people's mm -hmm. role are really, really important uh, in the in the countries, in their countries. Um, and if we talk about the region, 
grassroots communities, uh, youth-led organizations, uh, when they can support each other, I think that's one of the point of becoming a role model for the young people itself. So young people as a role model for young people. That's my first point. The second point is young people still, still need accompaniment. So we cannot just be left uh, alone. We still need accompaniment from, from the seniors. So I think collaborations, more collaborations between young people and also this, the seniors will have uh, extensive experiences in the peace building matters uh, with these collaborations, engaging the young people, uh, the active peace builders to empower others. I think this is, this is gonna make great impact, not only in the region, but to of course in the implementation of the UNSCR uh, on youth peace and security. Thanks, Akata. Arnie, I think uh, that you have uh, or that you want to add something. Yeah, I, I'm uh, listening to what you bring forward here. Uh, reminds me about uh, very, e very simple things like how is the life of the individual growing from uh, uh, because the three first years in your life is very important. It will uh, make you to be a certain person or with some ideas and also uh, resources. But it's important to have a look at how the family is functioning for the individual in general. That's very important because I have seen in a police force and I have seen uh, in other cases that many families, if there is a lack of support it will follow the generations and um, they will also inherit the things uh, from uh, from the old one and to the young ones and then um, uh, the, it's also concerning um, oh uh, sorry i lost it but um, i'm very concerned about the, the young people because we know also that from uh, refugees coming to Norway from from different uh, nations. They have some of them have a lack of fatherhood because they in Norway the family structure is different from other places like the Middle East and Asia and whatever. And uh, it's very important that the children they have a uh, good support. To, uh, to be a model in the correct way in life. This is very important. So, uh, and I have also, uh, uh, see, I've seen it in praxis. So uh, this is only the thing I want to say so far. Thank, thanks, Arnie. Mr. Free, would you like to uh, continue our consultation on the segment three? I think, I think Jan had something to add to that as well, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. Yes, thank you for, for uh, remembering me. Um, I heard from everything you are saying is co correct. And for me as a, as a journalist, uh, I am trying to, to narrow down what, what do I see? What is the most important here? And it is not so much a matter of age itself uh, or gender itself. It's more a matter of respect. Uh, it is disrespectful to keep people in ignorance. It is disrespectful to keep people in poverty. Uh, and it is dis 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 disrespectful and misuse of power to keep people uneducated. Uh, when that is said, I would love to see leaders who are female and young, because they would be better than any man I know on this planet. And I will not mention uh, any special horrible leaders, um, even if I could. Oh yes, I can. Uh, like one example would be Donald Trump. Say no more. Thank you. 
Thanks, Jan. Mr. Uh, Free. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the answer. Now, as you uh, as as we all would agree that there is a direct need to change the mindset. And uh, the answer I would like to ask you: How do we approach the beef milling uh, in the Middle East for that matter? And do you see, uh, in, how in your view, the young people uh, role in security and the peace in this region away from more lenient approach that views them as a passive or re recipients of the violence? What do you think? So? Oh, that was for me? Yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, I, I see that uh, uh, things have to change and it will change more rapidly. Um, very much can happen through NGOs, but global uh, formalized organizations will have a key role in the world. You cannot create world peace or world health by cutting the funding of, for example, world health organizations. You have to work together you have to stand together, you have to support each, each other, and you have to do much more than my generation did because all we did was to go to Woodstock and say peace. That didn't create peace, but it created fog. Thank you. Thanks, Jan. Uh, question for uh, Mi Sir Mitrul. Uh, how Middle Easterns have faced a degree of discrimination especially Muslim men and women, and how that hinders confidence building? Sorry, can you please repeat? I didn't get the request. Okay. Uh, how Middle Easterns have faced a degree of discrimination, especially Muslim men and women, and how that hinders, hinders confidence building? Could you please turn your audio? Oh, yeah, sure. Thank you uh, very much, Marit. Yeah, so actually, unfortunately, I cannot talk much about this thing because my living realities are different than in Middle Eastern. I haven't experienced uh, much of their culture. Uh, so I would recommend someone from the region can speak more about it. That would be really great. Uh, OK, Mr. Adam, would you like to add something on this question? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, it's a bit of a loaded question. Uh, it's implicit that there's discrimination towards uh, peoples of the Middle East. Um, but I'll generalize it. It's not just the Middle East, it's people of color, generally speaking. And for the majority of the participants here, I think you all know what that uh, feels like. There is um, Often, um, when you this is an issue that I've encountered a lot when dealing with organizations that come to work with NGOs on the ground. There is a high level of condescension in terms of uh, telling people on the ground um, what it is they should be doing or what it is that they're facing. Um, that's uh, coming from a place of privilege. A lot of developed countries, frankly, even if they've worked in these regions for a while, they still will not grasp the immediate reality of uh, what a bleak future looks like to a young person who uh, can graduate, go to the best university in the country, and probably not even get a job afterwards that actually fulfills them. So yes, this is an issue. And um, my specific issue with it isn't the uh, racism inherent in it, perhaps, although this is, again, broadly speaking, not everybody is like this. My issue is what it does to self-identity. Um, if you look at a lot of the civil society movements in history that have been successful, from the Martin Luther King movement, and these are people that have confronted incredible racism and discrimination, um, to other social movements in Europe, by the way, they all had one thing in common, which was the uh, self-identity of somebody who was there to make a difference and who knew he or she had it within them to make that difference. It was an incredible amount of self-belief, even amid doubt. Um, and this forms national identities and national identities um, taken together as a generation form history. You know, um, In our countries, I'm sorry to say, there is um, an incredible moral fatigue um, there is a lot of apathy, and these are structural issues for the most part, but also uh, how we choose now to identify ourselves. Um, I'm telling you that the majority of youth now, when confronted with the op option of activism and social work, 
will ask you, what's the point? Nothing ever changes. And to a large extent, they're very correct. Um, we have to recognize that the issues we face today uh, cannot necessarily only be solved through conventional means and the best practices we read about and the uh, policies we implement. A lot of it comes down to nitty gritty, uh, long-term coordinated um, work, essentially, that uh, does not resist, does not relent. And one of the comments mentioned this, they said that um, civil society, the change brought about through civil society and the grassroots has to be willing to bear the cost that comes with sticking true to your ideals. And um, the reality is in our regions, that cost can be a state crackdown. It can be uh, isolation, ostracization and disenfranchisement and the rest of it. So um, yes, we. but the positive side, if I can end on that, will be uh, that in our generation more than today, the uh, future and the horizons we face are unprecedented. And I don't say that in a vague cliched way. If you go back 50, 60 years ago, the possibilities for communication and coordination we're very, very different compared to now where you, with your smartphone or with a well-designed uh, project, you can engage hundreds and thousands of people to work together on a specific issue. And um, this is necessary because a lot, what people don't realize is a lot of the efforts that were conducted previously, historically, to combat issues of poverty and youth engagement and the like, um, were very linear. And they confronted issues that were very complex because the issue, for instance, of youth radicalism is linked to, as um, Ernie mentioned initially, for instance, family and uh, presence of fatherhood. It's it related to issues of crime and uh, poverty and economics and, and education and, and uh, social mobility uh, pathways. And it goes on and on and on. So any specific sector uh, of civil society trying to address an issue will come up short unless they're able to coordinate effectively. And the basis of all that is identity. And discrimination, I can tell you, does not help but we are now in a position to do more than ever before. Thank you very much, Mr. Adam. So, uh, Mr. Shri, I give you to uh, I give you to the uh, floor uh, to the last question on our segment. Uh, thank you, Pastor. So, as we have discussed at our extensively about the developments that have been there, taking place in the global scenario, and also discussed about what has been done in the Middle East. So I would like to ask a distinguished panelist about uh, sure. taking a longer view. Hey, you are not very clear. Does it mean, can you ask the question, the last question, because you're clear? Uh, Ma'am, am I audible? Yes, you're audible. Go yes. Ahead. I'm so sorry for that. Uh, so uh, you know, I'm asking this to our distinguished panelists, uh, taking the longer view. If you picture the Middle East, uh, what do you want to see? The develop, in the terms of development in Middle for uh, Middle East in the next 25 years. If you can mention about three things, what do you want to see the most in the Middle East in the next 25 years? This is an open uh, This is a question to our, all our distinguished panelists. For each does, does someone want me to repeat the question if it's not clear? Yes, please. Uh, okay, okay so, I will re I'll repeat it. Yes, thank you, Faisal. Okay, uh, taking a longer view. Uh, if you picture the Middle East, you want in uh, 25 years. What three things uh, would you most want to see in the Middle East region? Uh, starting from Adam, uh, then Jan, and do, others. Do the panelists want like a minute to think about it because we're talking about the next 25 years, but if you guys don't want that minute, I can just open the floor for anyone who wants to answer, really. Oh, I can I can just talk while. Uh, yes, while, yeah, uh, go ahead. Jan. Because uh, I'm not. Um, um, I can also fun. add. Yeah, oh, oh no, age before beauty. No, no, no. <laughs> okay, I see from '66 and today many things has taken place, and I will believe, like it is today that this will go on in a positive manner. I believe that uh, there will be more peace in the area because I know from the past that both uh, or the different uh, nations or ethnic groups there are more closer to one another than I will admit. Because I can take a very quick story. It's uh, the time of the Yom Kippur War when the Egypt was supported by Soviet Union and Israel was supported by United States. And, and uh, Saddam, Assad, the Egyptian, 
uh, he didn't want to talk to the Russian when I came on a visit, but he was talking to Mr. Kissinger. Kissinger and uh, the Egyptian commander, they made it together. But the Russian, they just came in support and that's all. So the Egyptians and uh, or the Arabs and the Israelis, they are more close than ever, I would believe. And it's so, it looks like that today as well when the things are going forward in the Middle East. So I think that in 25 years, it will be quite different in a positive way. Thank you. Thank you, Arne. We would like to uh, uh, know the opinion of Mr. Jan. Mr. Jan, could you yes. please share with us? Thank, thank you. Uh, straight, very, very, uh, very good uh, question. Uh, I always try to keep an optimistic view, and it is because of things I have experienced the last years during my, my uh, career, uh, where I see more and more uh, global think tanks. Uh, I can see new things pop up, uh, like uh, global policy insights in India, GPODs, International Education for Leaders, more and more global thinking, and, and the old buzzwords from I was uh, uh, from when I was driving by the university in, in the 70s, where we learned that um, think globally, act locally. I think that each country has to shape its own future. Uh, but everyone will come out as a winner. And that is thanks to young, intelligent people like we see here today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Mr. Shrey, I give, I give you to the floor uh, to the questions. Yes, Rutaba. We want to Good hear one. from Agatha and Medul if Medul is still here because they haven't answered this question. Okay, uh, Agatha, Medul, do you have any suggestions and yeah. any perspectives? Okay, I can answer this first. Um, Thanks, Agatha. So, um, before I answer it, I think twenty-five years is relatively or quite um, quick time, like not not so, so long uh, compared to the history of the Middle East itself. So I, I want to be optimistic, but I want to keep it realistic. So my first wish is to, to have less conflicts um, in the region. That is the first, of course. Second is um, I'd love to see more uh, participations of minority groups um, and also young people participations in the decision making process. Uh, the third one is to um, promote the, uh, the curriculum of culture of peace or the peace studies since very early age for, for the people in the Middle East. Thank you so much. Thanks, Agatha. And uh, so sorry, guys, I'm jumping in again and again. Middle, can we get the last word from you? Because I know that you have a meeting and you have to go. So the next 25 years, what do you want to see in the Middle East? Do we have Middle with us? I can also Middle? speak on this. I haven't really been from the Middle East and all that. Could you repeat that, Adam? Um, Rachel is here with us, but I think he has to unmute his mic. Yes. Rachel? Okay, not sure. Okay. 30 seconds. Yeah, Adam, you have to say something? You have to add something here? Yeah. Um, sure. You said over the next 35 years, correct? 25. 25. Okay. Does that change uh, your answer? It does, actually. Yeah, it does. Oh, okay. So my, my background as a strategist comes to play in these sorts of things. Um, I'll keep it very brief. Uh, the first thing I would love to see, and which I think is necessary as a matter of existential survival, is seeing uh, open source journalism take root in the uh, Middle East and the developing world. 
and um, using the excellent technologies available, open sourcing from the field, and essentially providing alternative means of uh, reporting on government policy accountability in a way that can't be controlled by uh, states. That's the uh, first thing. The second thing, I would love to see a culture of good governance, um, a national culture, of a consciousness, so to speak, where people discuss um, not just the tags and declarations of policies, but also the effectiveness of the policies that are implemented. And um, as I mentioned previously, we don't, it's not the issue of uh, lack of policies or strategies, it's the issue of implementation. And a lot of this comes down to public policy decision-making, it comes down to uh, a lack of accountability on the government side, it comes down to uh, absence of management science, honestly, and execution and follow-up. So I would love to see youth leading the change, the call for more accountability on effective policies. Uh, that's uh, number two. And number three, I would love to see, again, led by the youth, the inclusion of big data in uh, public policy decision making and recommendations, because uh, what we don't realize is that when we bark up the wrong tree, we pursue policies that there is an art and science, a strategy, essentially, and youth need to learn it. But when we pursue policies um, individually or separately from the larger context and equation, or things that cannot be addressed before other matters are resolved, again, through proper study of the data that is available, uh, we can waste a generation, essentially. And uh, the unfortunate issue is that when it comes to resolving low indicators, for instance, on education and healthcare and whatnot, it can take an entire generation to see results, as with, let's say, graduation rates or um, uh, inclusion of females in the workplace and, and so on and so forth. So we need to be more precise in how we uh, identify these, these social viruses, these uh, political issues, and, and bring all our force to bear on them. Thanks, Southern. Um, is it possible for us to take, I, because there are a lot of questions in the comment box, we were not anticipating that many questions and I would want to open the floor to maybe three questions if the panelists are okay with that and then we can move on to the concluding remarks. Is that okay with everyone? Great, so anyone who, of you who wants to ask the question, right? Just raise your hand. You should find the option right in the panel, right? Um, and I will give you the floor um, so I see Sadaf Iftikhar raise your hand. Sadaf, are you here? All right. I also see Greece Dysik, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Are you here? Um, sorry that my name is 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 wrong. Cause some technical issues. Uh, Good night from Indonesia. Hello, everyone. My name is Hafiz Gifari Berlanto from Indonesia. And what I want to ask is, since this, this, this discussion is also regarding about the current situation in the Middle East, what I want to ask is uh, how for us as the youth can contribute more, especially to the uh, peace and security problems in the world? Since what I seen that um, not many young people are involved in peacemaking in peacemaking situations for achieving peace. Thank you. Um, I quickly want to read mid mid middle. Can is your mic working? Excuse me. I think he has left the meeting. Let me check uh, again. He was there. Yes. Yeah. Because I don't wanna want him to leave without us saying goodbye to him because he's been very <laughs> generous <laughs> by being part yeah. of the conversation. Um, okay. Since I cannot hear Middle, unfortunately, would any of the panelists like to answer that that question? Agatha, would you like to address that question? Okay, I was. I was about to answer it actually. Uh, thank you so much for for the question. Sorry, I didn't get your name, but um, I think um, it's when we talk about how the young people can contribute. Of course, there are so many layers on how we can contribute on individual, on community level, on country level, region level. But in the case of the, if we we in the context of um, of peace building in the in, in Middle East, I think we have to be aware of um, to what extent can we can we participate or contribute in the 
in the peace building process. So uh, uh, actually one of my suggestions it would be on dialogues because uh, I have I, my, myself actually I've been um, championing um, interfaith and intercultural dialogues. So I think uh, as young people, what we can do is to support them by, by conducting dialogues uh, on how to support them, giving uh, motivations and also sharing of experiences because we cannot just um, up give suggestions or, or or putting out the context of our our own region to their condition and that's not going to work so what we can do is engage them in this dialogue and i have actually did a little bit of research and actually you and um uh, wait let me check my notes um un alliance of civilizations young peace builders on uh, Middle East and North Africa. They already made um, trainings and also initiatives for young peace builders in the region. So I think as young people with our own organizations, we can engage with them, um, connect with them, uh, build network on how we can also contribute in giving um, opinions, thoughts, or, or lesson learned that we can share to them. So they can also learn from our experiences without being uh, obliged to, to do what, uh, what we have experienced in our own condition. Another one from dialogue is also to promote more um, collaborations among young youth among youth organizations, because uh, there are so many youth organizations related on peace, however, I have to say that um, they also have their own interests. So I think one of our biggest homework is on how we as youth organizations, we can make collaboration uh, projects. We can have collaborative initiatives, not only work in our own organizations, but together as young organi as youth organizations uh, in the region or in, uh, in wider um, scope of the world. Thank you, Ms. Agatha for the answer. That is very helpful. Yeah. Does any other panelists want to jump in on that question or should I take another one? I can, I have a few words only, oh, thank you. I think that uh, from past experience that we, especially from the Western world, should be a little bit more careful to implement too much in uh, the, the region because we have another way of thinking and our culture is quite different. And uh, I have experienced that the, fail, the failure that has been done is caused by these two subjects. And I was also told uh, regarding uh, the conflict in Syria, I was on a lecture with the former UN general, Mr. Mood from Norway, and he concluded his uh, lecture with telling that in Syria, they wanted to make it themselves. Thank you. All right, great. I see that Ron Dukos, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, has a comment and a suggestion rather. So I would want to open yes. the floor for suggestions as well, not just questions. So Ron, uh, you have the floor. What suggestion do you have? Well, uh, before institute before institutionalized change, I think what we need to prioritize more is the narrative that is prevailing or that um, limits the youth from making or helping pragma um, pragmatic changes in, our, in, in peace and security. I think we need to focus more on the narratives that, that, pre that limits the youth from taking course of actions, especially in this on this matter. Um, personal, in my personal experience, I find it very limiting if we have the narratives that works against us. And I think nar um, narrative changes is important um, before um, going on to actually discussing with um, policymakers about in institutionalizing changes in peace and security. Thank you. Thank you. It's always nice to hear young people have their own thoughts and have built up the courage to be able to say what they think. I'm going to take one last question. I see Samra Qureshi's hand is raised up. Uh, Samra, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear All you. All right. Why don't you ask your question? 
yes so basically i have a, a question followed by a, a little uh, you know suggestion as well so basically uh, my question uh, revolves around uh, the disparity that is created between regions and states that are not uh, you know uh, under conflict or uh, are at more or are at a more peaceful uh, scenario for example there are states which are not um, uh, they do not have economic issues uh, socio economic issues or border disputes or other kind any kind of uh, uh, wars going on within them uh, and there are which are uh, quite all okay they don't have any hindrance uh, for the youth that uh, stop them to move forward to build their career peacefully and to make their future in a in a proper way so being the youth and having uh, being the uh, organization united nations for all these states and uh, the representation for youth as we're talking about let's take middle east as a case study over here so if we compare mid, uh, the youth of middle east from other uh, regions of the world uh, the youth do not have uh, that kind of uh, exposure to to the career they want to join in or the future they would, they would love to have um, uh, for them so what un do have uh, do you have uh, do you have have any suggestion or any structure that uh, uh, eliminate the disparity among the, the regions and can provide more opportunities to war stricken areas and uh, conflict areas so because the conflict is not created by the youth it is created by mostly governments or the people in the power not by the youth so but they are ultimately affected uh, due to that so how can uh, youth bypass the conflict and um, make their own career and future and move ahead without being Political it's a pretty loaded question with a lot of elements yeah. within it. Um, so any of the panelists that would like to sort of dissect some of the points that Samra has raised and maybe answer that. Adam, did you raise your hand? Yeah, may, yeah. may I? May I just uh, ask, um, Arna, uh, you have experience from different regions, uh, especially from Middle East, but can you see special challenges uh, as the question is raising for the Middle East youth? Uh, I have experience from Balkan for uh, three years in the wars, and uh, I see that uh, there are some hidden agendas that we have to find on the way because there are much interest in a war. We know that for many or for several wars are great business. That is a problem. And, uh, <clears throat> but we have to attack the problem and we also have to give uh, people the opportunity to take part in the peace process and I also see that uh, in both regions, both Balkan and the Middle East, that the young people are coming more forward to present their wishes. But uh, there is no specific, uh, I can, uh, what should I say, uh, point on, but they want, they, they look into, especially Scandinavia, without COVID. So, uh, and then they want to have it like we have it to cross borders as we want to without passport and whatever. This is, uh, this is uh, something that has come up on in both regions. So, uh, and, uh, but we know that the war does uh, are caused by religion, uh, history, and uh, ethnic uh, backgrounds and water at least. So uh, there, are, uh, there are so many things that uh, I can't bring especially things forward to solve it. Okay. Did I answer yeah, your question? I only Samra Kresh would be able to tell, but I hope you have. Um, so I'm just gonna hand over the floor to Adam for like the last bit of answer that he has and then we're going to quickly move to the concluding statements adam you have the floor what do you have to say uh thank you sam for the question it's a complex one as rotaba mentioned but 
uh, the gist of it, what I understand at least, is that you're driving at the issue of disparity between countries and how even in countries without war, youth are not necessarily uh, moving forward and what we can do about that. Um, in the Middle East specifically, I'm sorry. In the Middle East specifically, to keep it uh, contextualized, uh, war is not the primary issue, as uh, Arne just mentioned right now. The amounts of youth that are seeking better lives beyond their own borders, uh, it's an issue of disenfranchisement and disparity. And at some point, if you look at history, at some point with the Industrial Revolution and the rise of nations, and the fall of nations as well, uh, some countries got ahead and some countries were left behind. And in a lot of these cases, there were agendas that worked on putting in place leaders that uh, catered to uh, external interests. And this is why you had uh, uh, military supported, you had, you had the support of military coups and autocrats and dictators in the region. And these guys were excellent partners to the uh, developed world. And um, they did people's bidding on the ground. This is not controversial. This is simple fact. Um, and now, though, you have, with globalization, you have a lot of youth that are frankly, able to see through television, social media, what life can be like. You can't uh, hide it from them anymore. And for the first time in generations, you have this massive conflict between the social contract that was previously accepted in the Middle East, in any case, one of stay silent, don't enter politics, and let the elites continue to milk the country of its resources for private personal use. Um, leave the military aside, leave the uh, generals aside, leave the uh, business interests aside, just live your life, go to work, and that's it. So there is a fundamental change now more than ever. And um, in the same sense that developed countries made their way forward and uh, broke the ladder after them, there is now a, if we're talking about simple humanism, there is a need to uh, help those in need and give them a leg up. Um, because the issues of migration, of war, of um, disparity will never go away for as far as we can like look at history. Disparity has always been an issue, but they can be mitigated. They can be mitigated to the point where we achieve some semblance of stability. And unfortunately, yes, warfare now is a means to an end. It allows for greater securitization. It allows for greater state control. It allows for repression in the name of national security. And this is something we've seen the world over. So we need to navigate between all this and understand that ultimately, um, I disagree, frankly, that wars are fought for religious reasons. I think religion and ideology are the justifications uh, for pragmatic reasons, perhaps. Um, so we need to navigate between all this and understand that ultimately the only way forward for these regions and for the youth in them is to begin on, on, on working and giving these youth a better life, one that they desire and they hope for. And this is not something unreasonable that's being asked for. As always, the devil's in the details, however. Um, achieving that is the question that we've been asking ourselves in the UN and the OIC for uh, decades, frankly. Um, we have known what to do for a very long time. It always comes down to the execution. And on that, um, just to leave it an engaged note, I would like to say that when it comes to the responsibility of youth, dialogue is excellent, engagement is excellent, holding activities is, is excellent. But let's not hold these events for the sake of holding these events to be woke and engaged and have an active, vibrant civil society. Um, you need hard action on the ground. You need um, actual pragmatic change. And therefore, as young members of society, uh, with privilege, frankly, of being educated and being aware of these issues, we need to be able to look at ourselves and say, what is it that I'm lacking? What do I need to know to affect the change? Um, we can't simply go into lectures and then speak uh, generally vaguely about the change that needs to come. We need to be able to talk about technicalities and specifics and, pat and, and steps along this, this plan. And to, this, to do this, we need to realize uh, the art of strategy, the art of organization and social organization, and to keep our spirits high and our hopes raised. Okay, that was very well summed up. Um, I'm gonna move towards the concluding statement. I'm really sorry, Fasladin and Shrey, I'm stealing your floor, but just give me a minute over here. Uh, we have with us Margo Lazaro, um, and it's a great fortune for us to have her be here and host us. Um, she's the president chair of the UN NGO Committee on Sustainable Development and Why, and the co-founder CSO of the SDG Impact Awards Community. If she can hear me and turn her on our video, maybe um, I would like to um, hear her thoughts on this particular consultation that we've held. Um, yeah, Margo, can you hear us? I can. Can you yes. hear me? Yes. yes. Hi. Hi. Go ahead. You know, um, I came in late because I was on three other Zooms before I got here. 
but all related to what you everyone was just talking about policy and involving <clears throat> the United Nations and, and how we go forward. I'm also a coordinating partner for UN 2020 as well. So and I don't have a very good uh, Wi Fi connection. So it'll be my photo. I apologize for now. Uh, yesterday, I tried it without that and it was not a good situation. I kept coming in and out of sound. So, you know, I'm uh, very happy to hear this conversation, but one of the things I want to say, I'm involved with the UN. I have another career working in film theater and TV, but also at the UN, I've been involved a very long time. And from the very beginning, from my heart and soul, I always believe that we should work in partnership with all, everyone, uh, intergenerational. I believe this always from the very beginning. And whenever we work in an intergenerational inclusive and I'm talking regions, include other regions in your conversations, invite them so you can hear what else is going on with them and see how it connects and what synergy you have. I think it's just really important. And for me, the sustainable development goals are truly our best roadmap forward for going toward the 2030 UN uh, Sustainable Development Agenda to leave no one behind. And you know, we all must, uh, we should look to work in partnership with, uh, with each other. And, you know, I uh, recently met someone who really highly impressed me as a leader. And it was Stephen Aiello from Debate for Peace out of Tel Aviv, Israel. They were going to come and do, they wanted to do a walking tour of the UN. And I said, no, no, we need to have a meeting with them. And they were all high school students that he brought with some, a few teachers from uh, Israel. They represented all ethnic backgrounds, all different religions. And when they and we created a meeting, we asked one of the UN agencies to give us space and they, we created a room for them to come in and speak with everybody. They so impressed everyone with who they were as leaders and how they actually empowered each other. And one of the things that they learned through the group was to listen. Everyone has a right to their side of what they what they feel. There were people who came away from there who are long term UN uh, uh, people engaged with the UN who said they were inspired by them. I just wish in a way that Stephen had been on this call because you all would have seen something really pretty amazing in that. I know he's going to be on the one, I think, Friday or a couple of days from maybe Monday in another call coming up soon. But what we, uh, it's a truly what I personally believe in, that we should all look to work in collaboration. And youth have always, it's always important to include youth in every conversation possible. If there's not a way into some of these conversations, I suggest you find a way to present and say, we want to be supportive. What can we do to help? I've said this to ambassadors at the UN, and you'd be amazed how that works out because you really, but you need to really mean it. It's just to say, how can we help you? As far as the uh, NGO Committee on Sustainable Development, we were, it's been a long time com uh, committee at the, UN, at the UN, but when I got involved, I wanted us to also look at how we could show up as being more businesslike so that we could really engage with all stakeholders there. So we really look to, if you go to our website, NGOCSC-NY, Org. You'll see that when we have our meetings, we often engage with ambassadors, high level, human agencies, grassroots. We want to include indigenous, we include everybody. Everybody matters in every conversation we're having because it's all relevant. We're now global. The world is it, it's local, but it's also global. Everything, and we've been saying that for a long time, by the way. Think local, act or think global, act local, but we need to act in every way locally and globally. For the SDG Impact Awards, this came together with a, a colleague of mine because we wanted to get the sustainable development goals out of the UN and into the world so we can empower people to know that they can also make a difference. And so this was, um, we've evolved it to this now. It's now become a community. We pivoted and this is due to the, you know, ironically, the situation with uh, the pandemic. It's like we, it's like we're, we're forming uh, communities, maybe it's because of Zoom, in another way. And we're, we decided also we were going to bring the UN to meetings we were doing, and that's what's been happening. But what we want to do is invite everyone to come to the SC, SDG Impact Awards.org and, and, and submit your solutions. We do ask that you give a pretty good description of what of what you're doing, but we want to cre create a community of solutions. It says awards, but it's about recognizing people for what they're doing.
So on that note, I just want to thank you all. And I just want to say, keep going. And anything that we can do to help support, I'm more than happy to do that going forward and beyond. It's just important that your voices be there. You know, you don't just have a right to do it, but it's sort of like you're obli we all need to step up. We all have a place at the table and in the conversation. And the most important thing is how do we take action? And part of that is listening to others to hear what they need and what's what's uh, what's possible. So thank you so much for inviting me. I appreciate it very much. Thank you so much for that, Marco. You're definitely right. There's enough space on the table for everyone. We don't really have to be selfish. Um, there's a in, infinite numbers of ideas and thoughts. That's something that we will always have as a human race. So we shouldn't be, uh, we shouldn't uh, hold ourselves back, no matter what our age. Um, I want to quickly reel somebody in who's made this possible, who's brought this conversation to us. That is Rory. Uh, Rory Monshine works uh, as a diplomat, as uh, our, she works as like a diplomatic friend at IAPS. She's the one who pushed all the regions to do this consultation. She kept telling us, I believe in you guys, you can pull this off. And she made us realize how important conversation is. So I don't think any co any consultation would be uh, complete without hearing from Rory. So Rory, if you can hear us, can you just say a couple of sentences quickly? Um, uh, and maybe we can just quickly wrap everything up after maybe just the concluding statement. You got it. Hi, my name is Rory Munshine and I'm the Director of Civic Engagement and Strategic Diplomacy at the International Association for Political Science Students. I'm also a Communications Associate at UN 2020. So I'm sort of here in two capacities because UN 2020 is also sponsoring this. Um, I want to thank all of the regions for hosting these UN 75 dialogues because it's so important to incorporate youth voices and voices from all the different regions and ensure that people from these different regions both know about the UN's work and can actively engage with it. So we're very much excited to facilitate these dialogues on subjects that really do matter to youth and hear youth voices. So I've attached the link to the UN 75 survey in the link down below. So please make sure to get your voices heard. Other than that, we are 19 days away from the UN uh, Peace Day as well. And we have 19 days to endorse the UN 2020's UN 75 declaration. And I wanted to make sure that you guys also knew about that because UN 75 is an opportunity for us to build back better. It's time for us to reform international institutions and make sure that we are incorporated. You know, you can't spell UN without you. So I wanna make sure that you guys have the information needed to engage with these dialogues as we continue on. So if you could please share the video, Rutaba, on what the UN 75 declaration is, then you guys can learn about some of these visions and definitely connect with us to make sure that you guys get involved in any way that you can. Thank you and I look forward to all of the upcoming consultations. I hope that you guys are able to hear this video, but here goes nothing. As the United Nations celebrates its 75th anniversary this year, we the peoples have united to call our leaders to use this moment to strengthen, innovate, and rejuvenate our global governance system. To this end, UN 2020 has undertaken a global, multi-sectoral, cross-regional dialogue to develop a coherent civil society vision for a strengthened UN system. The outcome of this dialogue is reflected in the UN 75 People's Declaration and Plan of Action. The video will walk you through some of its most important messages. At the time when change is progressing at the pace and scale and parallel in human history, we can and must lay the foundation for a better path for humanity. As the negative impacts of outdated national and global institutions, norms and values become ever more problematic. Humanity must respond as one people, united in vision while diverse in approach. The health crisis, climate crisis, and trends in dignities such as social, gender, and race inequality, and the absence of sufficient coordination to end even preventable challenges. Demonstrate the need for leadership characterized not by short-term victories, but by long-term vision and urgent action. A paradigm of us versus them no longer meets our needs. We, the people, recognize the reality of global interdependence. At the heart of the solution to today's challenges lies a sincere commitment to collaboration, innovation, and action. The time has come 
to launch a rigorous, nonpartisan, transparent and inclusive process to assess global governance gap and to develop a human strategy to fill them. We are asking global leaders and governments to establish a post-2020 international mechanism to follow up examination of the global challenges we have and identify options to make the UN more fit for purposes. Dedicated to the Undersecretary General level in the UN Secretariat, this position would bring deeper partnerships with civil society into the UN's work. Take urgent climate action. The transition to net zero carbon economies brings opportunities to reduce poverty, inequality, biodiversity loss, and injustice. Increase the funding of the United Nations. Shortage of funding undermines the effective actions of the UN. We call for the creation of a United Nations Parliamentary Assembly whose delegates would be directly elected by the people they represent. Realizing the vision of the world we would like to see at the centenary of the United Nations and beyond requires bold and fundamental transformation of the present global system. Let future generations look back on 2020 as humanity determined with one voice to shed harmful legacies and move to of dignity and hope. Let the United Nations, beginning with its 75th anniversary, join hands with civil society in shaping the vision and actions we so urgently need to create the world we so eagerly await. Make UN 75 count. Make UN 75 count. Make UN 75 count. Make UN 75 count. virtual round of applause for that. Uh, great work there with the UN 2020 declaration. Um, I will now hand back the floor rightfully to Fasladin and Shrey because I've stolen them midway, but now guys have the floor. Okay, thank you very much, Rutsawa. We thank everyone who spent their precious time and sat with us until the end of our interesting dialogue. This was, was a uh, really important topic that we had to cover. And I would like to give uh, Mr. Habibullah to our uh, concluding remarks. Mr. Habibullah. Uh, thank you, Fazil D. Uh, with the name of Allah, most beneficent, the merciful, uh, celebration on Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and his descendants. I am humbled uh, with the presence of our honorable guests, panelists, and uh, praiseworthy host as well. Uh, being a part of a provincial government of Pakistan, I belong to a department uh, which, di which is directly involved in uh, working for development of youth. Uh, from every walk here, and although issues discussed are here serious and critical, uh, however, I'm certainly glad with the participation overall. And uh, it's a pleasure uh, uh, and honor to be a part of this fraternity. So uh, I'm here to present uh, concluding remarks. But before I start, I would like to share a Urdu uh, couplet of uh, Urdu poetry from a Pakistani legend uh, named John Area. And yes, of course, followed by his translation. And because it is more relevant with our dialogues and consultations, and that is, Ek hi hath sato hai. और वो ये कि आज तक बात नहीं कही गई बात नहीं सुनी गई एंड द लिटरल मीनिंग्स ऑफ दिस कपलेट इज द ओनली यूनिवर्सल ट्रेजेडी इज नथिंग इज बीइंग हर्ड नथिंग इज बीइंग सेड एंड नाउ कम्स टू पर्टिकुलरली टू पाकिस्तान इन द दिस मिडिल ईस्ट कंट्रीज इट्स अ नोन फैक्ट दैट पाकिस्तान रिमेंड सीवियरली अफेक्टेड uh with the by terrorism in past decades but i am proud to that uh, to state that our authorities they uh, has taken bold steps um to uh, encounter the terrorism uh, related to uh, with the religious backgrounds ethnic backgrounds or uh, cultural issues and conducted more uh, op uh, uh, operations and talks with the relevant stakeholders and our department has also been striving uh, for the same to engage our youth in positive and productive uh, activities 
to keep uh, them, uh, them refrain from any kind of terrorism or violence. The con these consultations and dialogues are the need of the modern era and are highly appreciated. And in my opinion, the prevalence of peace is impossible without uh, security. And the security uh, comes with economic empowerment, social cohesion, social empowerment. And it is pertinent to mention here that these two are uh, the factors which our youth policy, the provincial youth policy of Sindh government emphasizes on. Furthermore, we also uh, emphasize on uh, civic engagement and political participation of our youth. And we have been uh, striving to uh, make it possible to achieve our goals. Uh, am I audible? Yes. All right. And if you want peace and prosperity to prevail and to achieve the sustainable development goals or the goals uh, in general, Dialogues and discussions and panel discussions uh, and these kind of consultations such uh, must be uh, encouraged and especially uh, when we are facing the global pandemic and regional disasters, major or minor. Interactive sessions, uh, in my opinion, uh, I have been interacting uh, with uh, youth led and youth focus and youth for last eight years or probably uh, uh, more than that. And I realized that interactive sessions with youth will definitely be uh, helpful in understanding their issues and needs, particularly spreading awareness among them, um, providing them the right uh, direction, guiding them to the uh, solutions, making their uh, understanding better and prepare them to play their role for peace and security. And uh, because uh, Hamaria, uh, we usually uh, do uh, see in our consultations and panel discussion that uh, we speakers speak a lot and we don't give the due time to our youth to express their issues to uh, actually uh, to give the, uh, them a room to uh, present their, uh, the solutions the way they think, the way they want to make it happen. Uh, I, I, I would recommend uh, that we should uh, give more time in discussion, dialogues, and consultation to our youth, and we should hear them. Furthermore, I believe uh, um, all this will uh, shall lead you and I together towards a more adoptable and executable uh, approach for policy formulation as policy uh, professionals are here and uh, towards strategic planning. Lastly, I would like to invite all the stakeholders to come forward, uh, work with us for youth development and for the peace building and the prevalence of uh, peace in Middle Eastern countries. We, uh, I would like to mention here that we have been uh, planning and working on a youth, international youth exchange program and provincial youth exchange program as well to uh, bridge the gap, gap between our youth. To, bridge the gap uh, to make it more socially uh, social cohesion uh, among them and to make them understand each other and that will lead us to uh, mm, peace building I, I hope and uh, i will ask our honorable host to share my uh, contact details for future correspondence i appreciate and congratulate uh, this great, uh, great initiative by uh, international association of political students and United Nations. I'm looking forward for the collaboration in future endeavors. I'm truly grateful for this opportunity to learn and share. Stay blessed. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Mr. Habibullah. Uh, we, think, we thank each panelist for their informative conversation uh, on the topic of youth, peace, and security in the Middle East. We had with us Mr. Jan Helch Halvik, uh, Mr. Arni Agata. Uh, Mr. Adam and Mr. Mridul. So in the ending of our conversation, I would like to end uh, with the phrase, it's about use. Try to learn and lead as much as possible. Thank you very much for you all uh, that have uh, stayed with us until the end of our interesting dialogue. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Same to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. You, everyone. Bye.